Good evening. My name is Tony Thompson, and I'm the faculty director of the Center on Race, Inequality, and Law here at NYU School of Law. And on behalf of the center, I'd like to thank you and welcome you to this year's inaugural public conversation, Media and the Movement, Deconstructing Journalism's Role in Race and Inequality. In this country, we value the freedom of the press with good reason. Even though the current occupant of the White House casts the media as the enemy of the people, we have seen and continue to witness the importance of having a voice outside of government that can ask questions, expose issues, and help otherwise an inattentive public pay attention to things that are important. So we look to the media to shine a light when the administration sinks to new depths. We look to the media to document the instances when the White House resurrects and enables a racist narrative that we once thought was relegated to the fringes. We look to the media to dig deeper, to open our eyes and our ears, and go places we can't easily go. But the problem is that the media has often helped to shine an unnecessary light, an unwitting accomplice to this administration. Now, of course, I'm not talking about some conventional media outlets who make no claim to be anything other than a propaganda wing for this administration. You know which ones I mean. They intentionally and without a bit of shame provide airtime, support, and political cover for this presidency. But the problem is that others, in an attempt to seem even-handed, do just as much harm by giving this pre president as much airtime as they do, by allowing his claims to distract us when he lies, to give him a pass when he targets, and to ignore him when he divides. The problem is that the media can and should help this country hold those in power accountable when they use often thinly veiled racist narratives to pass for acceptable political discourse on immigration, civil rights, and criminal justice. But now there is some good news, pun intended. For the first time in modern history, the world of journalism has a new face. The news cycle is changing, the types of stories that we are reading are changing, and those who write, edit, and broadcast the news are no longer the elite few. Indeed, some of the people on this very stage have given voice to the voiceless, have attacked injustice, and have been fearless in covering communities that have been put on the margins, overlooked, or at worst demonized in the press. It makes me so proud to share the stage with these four individuals. They've made it their business to chart a new journalistic path. And tonight, we look to begin a conversation about journalism, challenging the issues of race and inequality, the importance of exposing issues to stay true to media's obligation to speak truth to power. And to that end, we have put together a panel of distinguished voices, people who could on their own speak to the issues of this day. But instead of a panel of talking heads, we're going to have a conversation and you get to eavesdrop. I'm sorry to say that Sean King cannot join us. Unfortunately, he's had a death in the family. But we have a great panel. For almost 20 years, my friend Jen Gonerman has been covering the criminal justice system in New York and beyond. Jen was a finalist for the National Book Award, and her most recent work about Khalif Browder and the horrific conditions on Rikers Island led to a Pulitzer Prize nomination and has ignited a national conversation about the abolition of cash bail. In, in his role as a chief political correspondent at Slate and a political analyst at, NBC, at CBS News, Jamel Bowie has emerged as a leading voice on U.S. politics, public policy, elections, and race. In 2015, Forbes named him 30 under 30 in the media. Josie Duffy Rice, a lawyer, a journalist, an essayist, is a graduate of the Harvard Law School. Josie's writing on race, gender, culture, and politics has been featured in the New York Times, Slate, Ebony, and the Daily Cost, among others. Josie's currently the co-host of Justice in America, my new favorite podcast that focuses on criminal justice reform. And finally, one of our own. <laughs> Jake Sussman, a graduate of this law school. He was a Root Tilden Kern public interest scholar and one of my favorite all-time graduates. For nearly 15 years, Jake litigated criminal and capital cases, including scores of civil rights cases, before taking up the role as managing director of the Justice Collaborative, a policy and media organization working on criminal justice issues. Please join me in welcoming my panel. So we're going to get started. And let me remind the panelists that 
you don't have to wait to be called on. You can jump in at any time, even if somebody else is already talking. There's no reason to act any different up here just because we're in front of the room. Um, Jen, I want to start with you. Um, you wrote this important story about Khalif Browder. You changed the national debate and began a conversation about bail. Why is it that so few of these stories of this type of import are not featured more often in conventional media? Um, you know, the Khalif story was, um, you know, there's, there's a lot I could say about that, and it's, it's upsetting even to talk about, to, at, you know, right now, thinking about the whole situation, because the story came out in the fall of 2014, and, you know, some folks read it, but it was only really after he took his own life that the story got the attention that, you know, he thought and I thought that the situation really deserved. So, um, <clears throat> you know, thinking back about the whole sort of chain of events, it's like, it's sort of like beyond tragic what happened with Khalif, but I think, you know, one of the um, takeaways from all of that is the idea that most, you know, most of the media coverage for so long has been about sort of individual cases, individual crimes, something particularly horrific that happened. Um, and there's been far less attention in the media on sort of systems, how they work, how they don't work. Khalif's story, doing three years on Rikers Island, never being convicted of a crime, was like a window into this whole world of everything that's wrong in Rikers, everything that was not happening in the court system. And it actually ended up taking me six months to pull off. And that's just something about a time that journalists would never get to do uh, to a single story. So I think for all those reasons, um, you know, I think probably answers your question. Yeah, Jake, you're doing some stuff now um, with a more expedited news cycle in some respects to get local stories up. Do you have thoughts about why we don't see more of these stories? Well, I think some of what Jen is saying, that some of these stories require a deep dive, particularly I think when you're writing about local, local criminal justice issues are often, there's an opaqueness to the system. You know, district attorney's offices are black boxes. We don't really see, there are courts of no record. So sometimes it's hard to be precise when you're writing about these issues. Um, there are other folks probably on the stage who could talk about the decimation of local media coverage and how there's just not as much support for that. Um, and, and then there are subscribers and, and clicks and, and business decisions. Um, our model, you know, and as a result, there's a gap. There's not as many of these stories about Khalif Browder um, that we need. Uh, so part of what we were identifying with our project and putting out the appeal was to try to fill some of that gap uh, and try to shine sort of this persistent, unrelenting light on these local justice stories. So I want to pick up on this theme of the types of stories. Jamel, um, you've talked about publicly, um, and I want to hear your thoughts about what accounts for the lack of general public awareness of issues that disproportionately affect people of color and communities of color. I, mean, I, I think it gets to uh, some of these issues of uh, first news outlets just not having the resources to invest in the kinds of, not just systemic stories, but stories about very ordinary things, right? Like, it's, it's actually pretty easy to convince an editor to give you a bunch of time to write about something um, extraordinary. But the Khalif Browder story, what, what, what to me was so powerful about that is it was, in a lot of ways, a very ordinary story. Um, and it became extraordinary because he took his own life. Um, and that, those, sort of, uh, those sorts of stories of things that happen all the time that aren't especially remarkable but add, to, add up together into something quite um, powerful and quite terrible, I think it's just difficult. I'm not sure the business of journalism is built for even telling those kinds of stories in any kind of systematic way. Um, having said that, you know, I, there's <laughs> why, why aren't more people uh, attuned to, to issues affecting people of color is like, that's, that, that's sort of, you could write a history book about the United States that kind of takes that as its premise and runs with it. Um, beyond media questions, it's a matter of how we educate kids and, and civic education and sort of a narrative, we, the, 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 the traditional narrative of the United States that you learn in school is not one that's conducive to even asking those questions, right? Like you get this kind of Whiggish history of, you know, it's 2018 and uh, aside from uh, some injustices, everything is pretty decent for most people. And that's just, you have to have some curiosity yourself or have that conflict with something that happened in your life 
for you to even have the curiosity to want to go beyond that. And for most people, for I think understandable reasons, that's just not there. Is it an appropriate role for journalists to be in that space, to say part of my role is going to be to educate folks about communities and folks that are different than them? Oh, I think absolutely. Um, I think that's, I think that is 100% ought to be the role of journalists. Um, I, I'd like to think that in my own work, um, that's something I tend to do. Um, but the, ultimately, our audiences, it would be one thing if, you know, CNN were doing that kind of work on the regular, but CNN is not. Um, and the kinds of journalism in which that work is done is widely read, but not not widely read enough for, again, reasons that are understandable and, and make a lot of sense. And arguably, it's always been the case. It's always been kind of a small portion of the public that is uh, taking in journalism about those communities. So Josie, let me ask you, a lot of your work has begun to affect and push policy decisions. Um, what role should journalism play in changing or shaping policy, particularly policies that intersect with issues of race? Um, well, if you ask me, we should take a big role. <laughs> I don't know if that's the um, official line answer. I think that, um, like Jake said, because we work on local issues with local actors, the uh, return on our investment of writing these stories is much higher than it is when people, for example, you're not going to write an article about Trump and him change his policy. It's not how he works. But often, we're writing about people who never have had negative coverage at all. Um, and I think part of that is because they're mostly covered by local journalists who, uh, along with not having the resources or maybe the knowledge base or even the access, they also are trying to preserve relationships. It's, you're not trying to go against the local DA. If you're the local journalist, you need him for comment and stories. Um, so we've had a lot of success, I think, in actually getting people to shift their policies. I think part of that is that we're actually paying attention to them. And the other part is that their policies are so horrible that even uh, there's, they're, they're kind of, they're indefensible a lot of the time. Um, so once you push them a little, they give in because what else, what else can you do when, um, when you're doing what some of these people are doing? So, Jake, I want to stay in that space with you a little bit. Traditionally, in, in, in traditional journalism and conventional media outlets, there's this notion that, or at least maybe it's an age-old notion now, that media should be neutral or even-handed in its coverage. And that often results in, as I, in my opening comments mentioned, an undue focus in areas that we might not want to focus. And what's the role that media should play in terms of advocating for more just policies? Well, as the non-journalist on the stage, um, <laughs> And I do come at it, you know, unabashedly come at it from an advocacy perspective. Um, our view is that the sort of two sides of the story uh, approach on issues of local criminal justice can often do a disservice. Um, our frame is, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm stealing this from Josie, but it's a good line and it works, is that we're not debating climate change at the appeal. Um, we are not sort of engaging in the fact that there may be somebody out there who thinks it would have been a good idea for Khalif Browder to have remained in jail. And there are judges and elected officials and people who have that position, uninformed as it may be. Our thrust is that these are known truths, that there are incredible deficiencies, uh, deeply racist policies, um, age-old rhetoric that has been disproven time and time again, and that our frame should be on saying mass incarceration is real, uh, there are ways to fix it, and there are people who are accountable, and that's what we want the, the driving force of the journalism to focus on. Let me push this to Jen and to Jamel. Do we need to have some counterbalance on that in terms of the media, um, in terms of this notion of showing both sides, or is there an advocacy role in journalism? Um. Well, so that was always a uh, topic of debate at the Village Voice where I used to work. Are we, you know, what, what is the line? You know, we called ourselves advocacy journalists, but I always just felt like it was less about us being act activists and more about covering, like Jamel was saying, uh, topics, stories, individuals that have been ignored. And, and if that's a radical act, you know, that's a pathetic commentary on the media. But that is sort of, I felt like that was our role, not that the story should be slanted a certain way. And, and I, 
to, to build on what Jake was saying, this whole idea of like two sides of a story or he said, she said, I mean, that makes no sense in the context of covering the criminal justice system. Right. You should, sometimes you've got ten, si 10 sides of a story. You know, if you're trying to do like a sort of 360 degree look at a, at a certain issue. And so I think that's a sort of restricting way to think about it and not so productive. Um, but I certainly think that if you, you know, shine your light or pay close attention to some area that people aren't paying attention and things change as they have um, with some of the appeals work, that that's a fantastic thing. And I don't think that, you know, is being an activist at all. It's being a good journalist. Yeah. I, I tend to see it as the job of journalists is to tell the truth um, to the extent that we should be putting a thumb on the scale. Um, it, it relates to the kinds of things we're going to tell the truth about, right? So like it, it's the subjects we want to focus on, the individuals we want to focus on, the institutions we want to focus on. But once you're in the, in the, in the muck of actually doing it, your, our obligation is to tell the truth as best as possible. And if that results in you know, positive change in the world, that is, that is fantastic. Um, I, I too wouldn't think of that as being activism. That's just simply doing the job. Um, I think the, the both sides thing, the two sides thing is much more of a, it's like an, a real issue in political journalism where there is um, sort of outside the world of journalism and just in the way Americans think about politics, this idea that the correct answer or the palatable answer exists in the middle. And so translate that to the covering politics, well, you know, maybe if you uh, give equal balance to both sides of a question, then you'll get something approaching the truth in the middle. And I think what political journalism is struggling now, right, struggling with right now is the extent to which that just isn't true. Um, mm -hmm. That on a wide variety of questions, on sort of basic questions about the kind of society the United States is, there is an answer that you would say fit with American values as we traditionally understand them, and there is an answer that doesn't. And so is your obligation as a journalist um, to those values, in which case you're not really going to want to give an equal say or equal time to um, illiberal ideas, or is it to simply kind of balance coverage, in which case you do give time to those ideas, but at the cost of uh, giving them oxygen, giving them um, space mm -hmm. to grow in society, and then having to deal with those consequences. And I, I think the way my, my language here tells you what side I'm on on this one. Um, <laughs> I, I, have, I have a very hard time casting that in neutral terms. Um, but I think, I, th I think my way is the right way. Uh, I think the approach of, of, of thinking of journalism as a vital tool of a free society of a, you know, uppercase L, liberal, uppercase, lower, lowercase r, Republican society, um, and making your judgments given that as your backdrop. So let me actually want to stay with you for a minute. I, I've had to become well read on all four of you recently. And what, you often reference history um, and historical narrative in your work. And you've also expressed frustration with the lack of historical fluency among political journalists. Can you comment on how a better understanding of history can shape contemporary discussions about race um, in media? You've been reading her Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the, I, I think the, the, there's a couple ways. The, the first, for me, the first value of having a, uh, a real grounding in American history and covering American politics is just that you can sort of see if things have happened before. There's this, there's, there's like a presentist bias in political reporting of thinking that what's happening now is novel, um, but simply knowing what happened 30 years ago, six years ago, 160 years ago can help ground how you think about what's happening now and kind of see the degree to which it may fit into some sort of larger pattern, into some sort of larger dynamic. When it comes specifically to race, I don't, I don't think there's any way to cover racial inequality without grounding it in history. Um, I don't think there's any way you can communicate to readers, right, the scope of the problem without walking them through in some way the history of the problem. I mean, what I found, um, and uh, Josie, I'd be curious to hear you, what you think about this as well, what, what I found that if you don't do that, a lot of readers are simply bewildered, right? Like, because much, things like, things like housing inequality, um, inequality in the criminal justice system are opaque by design. They're not immediately obvious. And so simply declaring that they're there, um, while true, to get readers to really internalize it and to really accept it as being true requires a bit of hand-holding through how we got here. 
Josie, I want to pick up with you in a similar subject, but what do you see as the most significant problems at the intersection of journalism, race, and the law? Problems? I think for me it goes back to something that Jake said at the beginning, which is what I, we're faced with every day, which is the fact of how opaque these systems are. And there is a constant sense that no one is watching the watcher. Um, for every story that we find about a local DA or a local cop or a local judge, I'm always just plagued with the knowledge that there are 200,000 <laughs> stories like that that we're not finding, that we're not gonna hear about, where someone isn't gonna be able to, to tell us um, what's happening. You know, I, I think when I was in law school, I, had an, I thought I had an idea of how things worked and it wasn't until I left and could actually see it on the ground that I recognized how many small decisions are being made every single day that are creating something so much bigger. Um, and, you know, there are 2,300 DAs in America. 2,300, 3,200? One of those two, 2300. Um, and uh, a lot of them are perpetuating racist injustices every single day openly, you know, intentionally, um, and we can't get them all. So one of, the, one of the things we're always faced with is we don't know what we don't know. Um, trying to figure out how not only to get the stories that we're hearing about, but create a system where it's more transparent and more accountable. Um, to the people that are actually in the system, rather to sort of its internal self. How do you, Jen, I'm, I'm listening to what Josie is saying about the, the sheer volume. Um, whether it was your book, outside, Living Up on the Outside with Elaine Bartlett, or whether it was Khalif Browder, um, you've become pretty good at elevating individual stories to larger issues. Um, how does that happen? How do you identify those issues, or do you? Are you simply telling a story about the individual? Um, <clears throat> you know, when I started covering the criminal justice system, which was quite a while ago, like in the late 90s, I have to say there was nobody covering the criminal justice system. I mean, it was to the po I was at the Village Voice, and it was to the point where you didn't have to worry if you're writing a story or something that somebody was going to beat you because nobody was even mildly <laughs> interested in covering any of the same stuff. And it was... You know, now we fast forward 20 years and it's heartening to see the fantastic work you guys are doing um, and so many folks are doing, but the situation is basically the exact, as, this, exactly the same as it was 20 years ago. We were over two million people in prison in 2002 and we're still over two million people in prison. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, this question of telling stories, I felt like from the beginning that the only coverage the criminal justice system was getting back then was numbers. You know, there would be the kind of perfunctory newspaper story, maybe on the AP wire. We've reached over two million, like six paragraphs. It was just, it was just that people only covered it as statistics. It was like there was, you know, and this may say more about who was in, uh, you know, in the newsrooms back then. But I mean, it just was n no relationship to what was really going on. And um, you know, I just sort of made it my mission way back then to try to, you know, tell individual stories because I felt like the only way that was going to begin to get people to kind of wake up to the reality of what was going on. So Jake, I want to ask you, do you institutionally look for the stories that will, I think Jen is a masterful storyteller, so people get engrossed in the story of the individual and I think the broader issue speaks to itself. Um, you've been very successful as I, at identifying whether it's inappropriate DAs or judges or um, other actors in the criminal justice system, do you look for the issues as you're trying to identify how to surface some of these concerns? I mean, in a sense, um, our project sort of writ large is full of lawyers and journalists and people who are constantly consuming criminal justice information and many of us who have been in courthouses and, and jails for a, a lot of our experience, whether we're covering them or representing people, know that there are a million untold stories happening every day in the courthouse. And so the same way that the Khalif Browder story in many respects is a, is a common story, there, and, and there have been other Khalif Browders since, since Khalif, in the Bronx at Rikers. Um, we're just, our focus, our mission is saying we know what's happened, the, that the local courthouses, the local criminal justice system is the driver of mass incarceration. 
So if 87% of the people incarcerated in our country in custody right now are somehow connected to the state or local justice system, that is where the action is happening and that is where injustice is happening. And we know that this is not a passive system. There are people making affirmative decisions every single day and it has been said much more regularly over the last couple of years that the most powerful person in that equation is the prosecutor. And so if we just stay in that space and look and say, is it lying, is it cheating, is it just banal, unthinking, but yet grotesquely terrible decisions that are being made, we will find these stories. And there is no shortage, so there's no shortage of the story. And I, I just to the point about the data, I think is really important. Um, I think Jamel had written about this, so if I'm getting it wrong, but a couple years ago you wrote something about how we have all this amazing data but it's not enough. Like we know how many problems there are. We know how unfair this, this system is. And so when we just stay in the courthouse and we find this available data and we can match it up with these stories that public defenders or other people share, um, we just haven't left that space, I guess is, what, is, a, is a long way of saying that's, that's just where we're gonna, we're gonna stay. The problem is the data is one thing, but race is difficult. And you know, I, I want to allude to kind of the false narrative in the last presidential election. We got from the media that this was about blue collar workers and their dissatisfaction when the true story was this was really about race. Um, Jamel, why hasn't race played more of a central role in some of this coverage, be it a presidential election or the, the national discourse every day in the mainstream media? I mean, to, to borrow from Jen, I think it's a newsroom problem. I mean, the journalism is still a shockingly white industry. Um, and in the case of the presidential election, I think there was a real dynamic happening where for a lot of reporters, for white reporters, to say that what was motivating some number of voters wasn't just sort of, you know, generalized anxiety about the world, but specific racial anxiety and, and racial animus would require sort of hard questions, not just about you know, the people they're covering, but potentially about the people in their own lives. Um, I think there's a sociological element um, to, 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 making that, to making that leap. Um, when you sort of add that to the, I think the, the, what was, I think, conventional wisdom, which is that explicit racism just doesn't really motivate people anymore, and I'll firmly cop to also thinking that. I mean, I 100% thought Trump was gonna lose, and my rationale was like, people, like, candidates that are just that openly racist don't win. Turns Surprise. out that's not true. Um, and that actually has actually, I think, major implications for how we think about American politics that are still, people are still kind of coming to grips with. Um, but it, it, I think it's harder, I think it's easier to accept that um, as a person who may have a direct experience with racism than as someone for whom racism is something that happens to other people. Um, I wanted to actually ask a quick question to Jen, and that was, you said earlier, um, kind of referencing the statistics about criminal justice, that nothing's really changed in the past 20 years. But do you think that the sort of, do you think that the public is changing in its orientation towards those issues? In my, in my head, I'm thinking about the um, initiative in Florida to restore felon voting rights, which is doing remarkably well among sort of all demographic groups. And that to me seems like a major like, indicator of change. You know, maybe I was a bit too pessimistic, but I guess when I was saying that nothing had really changed, I was thinking about the numbers. I was thinking that despite all the incredible work people were doing, we still hadn't brought the prison population down. But certainly, um, you know, that is an incredibly promising initiative. There's like, you know, thousands of those kinds of things going on around the country in ways big and small. And I feel like with folks in law school, folks in college, younger people, I really have a very, very different attitudes than older folks that are going to be the ones that are going to help us get out of the mess that we created. But you know, these systems are so intractable and the racism is so entrenched, um, I think it's gonna be incredib incredibly difficult. You know, it's interesting, over the past few years, maybe one of the only places we've been successful in the ballot has been prosecutor races. I mean, we had an interesting, <laughs> we had an interesting 2016 election night because we were like crying, but also like, yay, we won these 10 races, but also the world's going to hell. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is clear that across political spectrums, across geographies, across classes, people recognize that 
Um, this is not what they want from their criminal justice system. Um, and so even if it is not permanent, even if it is not changing the actual infrastructure, and even if people are, which we have found with some candidates, are saying what we want to hear but not doing what we want them to do, at least the tone is changing um, on some of this after you know, decades of you won your prosecutor race by whether you were the toughest on crime and that was just it. You know, there was just one axis. So let me stay with you a minute. You've written one of the most powerful pieces about the notion of a reform prosecutor. I'm gonna leave people's names out of it, but I identified a local prosecutor as not really being a reform prosecutor. Let me ask you something. We were all wooed with the passion of these new platforms for prosecutors running on a reform platform. And the, ne the question now is the next step. What have we seen different? And at least in some jurisdictions, we haven't seen much change. As Jen correctly states, the numbers haven't changed. We haven't seen, with the exception of a couple jurisdictions, a lot of people leave the office. And we've seen systems that remain pretty much in place. Um, what's the role that we have as media to shine a light on that and to say, hey, you ran on this progressive platform, but we still see these massive racial disparities. We still see massive incarceration rates. Is there a role for the folks you folks on stage, Jake included the non-journalists, in um, kind of sussing some of that out and holding their feet to the fire? Yeah, I would say, so probably the two most progressive prosecutors right now are, I would say, Kim Fox and Larry Krasner. That sounds about right. Kim Fox is in Chicago, and she beat an incumbent who had a history of uh, every kind of misconduct that you can basically imagine. And Larry Krasner beat an incumbent, or, or he's now in federal prison, different long earth story, but he, um, he had kind of run as a progressive prosecutor and then had not met um, the standard once he got into office. You know, like Cook County Jail was the biggest jail in America, um, the most populous that is, and it's not going to be empty overnight. Kim Fox still has a lot on her back in terms of feeling responsible for what crime looks like in Chicago, um, and the same goes for uh, for Larry. What I will say is that like both of them are now accountable to different people, and that doesn't just mean the journalists who spent a lot of time exposing Anita Alvarez and and um, Seth Williams, who were their predecessors, but also for decades, people were these candidates were looking for the police union support, right? They were looking for support from um, from law enforcement, and now they're looking for support from Black Lives Matter groups. I mean, that's, that's actually who got Kim Fox elected. Um, and so in some ways, by shifting accountability, not just towards knowing that as journalists will go after her, but also just activists in general, um, to, that that's who she's accountable to now and not the police union has an impact. It's not perfect yet, but I'd much rather be dealing with her than Anita Alvarez. And I, I think that in terms of the role that the media plays and, and the coverage of it is that the same way that we can identify all of the ills that are in the system and name them and shine a light on them is that when people do courageous things, mm -hmm. um, that should be talked about, that should be covered. Um, and again, with the advocacy hat on is the more, I think the more we get out into the world that it's normal to want a smaller jail in your county as an elected official. If I'm the sheriff or I'm the DA and I say, I want a smaller jail, that should, even though that may be unusual, we want that to, we want that to be replicated and we want that to be normalized. And so the more coverage of that, the more that those kind of courageous acts are highlighted and then you see that people are doing it around the country I think has real value, and um, I wouldn't call it cover for a district attorney, but these are hard decisions. Mm -hmm. And you're, anytime you start talking about crime, people get scared. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a huge role for continuing coverage and to sort of track how this is going um, and to call it out when they make a step, even if there's, there's always going to be a, a pushback, and then sort of keep tracking it over the years. Let me t I just want to follow up on that space for a minute. Um, how do we sustain a focus on a topic? So, you know, media did a great job when this administration began to detain children in cages on the border. Um, the nation was outraged. 
A few weeks later, the administration was doing the same policy, and media had moved on, and there was another focus. How do we sustain impact and focus on subjects in that way? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, in the case of, of child separation, some, some of the, the, the switched focus just has to do with the fact that the world is uh, insane, and <laughs> you know, uh, stories happen, major stories happen, there's tons of coverage, and then something very significant happens too, you know, 48 hours later, and coverage happens there. And I'll say, in, in, in defense of, of media, there still is continuing coverage of child separations at the border. And just today, there is a report, um, uh, there's reporting on an uh, Inspector General report of DHS kind of saying that DHS Department of Homeland Security claimed to have a database of, um, of parents and children and did not have that database at all. And so that's like a, it's a new part in the story. Um, I think continuing coverage is difficult because if it's not something that is actually very, that was high profile and is very affecting like child separations, it requires, this goes back to the beginning of our conversation, requires outlets to, to simply provide the resources for reporters to have that as a dedicated beat, to focus on it consistently and to um, uh, use that dedication, that time to, to build stories and, and break stories when they emerge. I wanted also to just make a quick comment about the prior subject about sort of uh, uh, shining light on positive developments. And I think in addition to the accountability aspect, it's it, a lot of that happens in politics happens because of inertia. It happens because of that's the way people have always done things. And so in terms of crime politics, it's always been the case that if you're running as a DA or something, that the way you win is by promising to lock up people. But if all of a sudden there are people who are, who are not winning that way and they're winning arguing the reverse and there's positive coverage on them, that, that's an incentive uh, for some prospective politician to maybe try that instead. There's this, um, uh, forgive me for this reference, in, uh, in Detective Comics number whatever that has Batman, that Batman appears in, he is discussing why he is dressing up as a bat. And he says, uh, criminals are a cowardly and fearful lot, and so I'm just gonna scare them. And I think you can say the same about politicians. Um, uh, and politicians are easy to spook. And one way to spook them uh, is by showing that they can either be defeated a certain way or that a competitor um, uh, can, you know, get in their heels by, by trying a different approach. And positive coverage is one part of that. Also, just being able to talk about risk, because if you are a DA, your incentive is to lock up the most people so that you don't risk having that one guy get out on bail who then kills someone, and then the story is, guy let out on bail, killed, you know. And that, and that is the only story. And there is no conversation about how many people are let out on bail and don't, kill, don't go out and kill people. Or, you know, what is the risk that, what, the thought of that being risk averse is actually inflicting a lot of harm on more people. Um, and so I think some of what we see our job as is allowing people to take the risk to step back and have a smaller criminal justice system and say, we're just not gonna prosecute petty theft, um, we're not gonna prosecute um, you know, sex workers, we're gonna make the choice to, to risk whatever could happen by not putting all these people in prison because we know that the, um, the net benefit is on the other side. I think part of it is how we redefine public safety as well. Right. And, and the notion that communities don't feel safer with more people locked up that are gonna to return to communities. We have to start thinking about that differently. Um, let me ask you this, and, and Jen, I guess I wanna start with you in this. Are there particular techniques that you use um, to get people to care about the stories that you're writing, to get people to care about these issues? Um, I don't have any special uh, tricks so or techniques. Some secret sauce no, I, I don't, don't have any share. secret sauce. I think people are genuinely interested in other people and really wanna learn about the special people that are different from themselves and learn about their lives. And if they're given the opportunity to hear directly from that person, you know, um, hear their quotes, hear them being interviewed, that, you know, usually you can really engage folks. Um, so, I don't know, I don't have any a special uh, secret answer. Maybe some of the other folks here have a, have a 
have a trick that I'm going to share on that. But I think people are genuine. You know, if, if the media is willing to cover it, if there are enough journalists to cover it, if there's enough journalists to have enough time to spend with people, which is sort of, I think, the key question here. I mean, this conversation, it's very hard to have this conversation without talking about the utter decimation of newsrooms across mm -hmm. the country. I just pulled up this article and brought it with me. It says newsroom employment dropped nearly a quarter in less than 10 years. So that means we lost close to 25% of journalists in the last decade. And it's probably even higher than that. I mean, I just remember a few weeks ago, half the Daily News newsroom was tossed in the street. And a lot of fantastic journalists, a lot of like people that really knew the history of New York. And I'm sure that's happening in other cities. Two, I just think that the time it takes to do a good story is you know, being lost, and, and the resources and the institutional knowledge. Well, there's two things that are happening there. My colleague, Rebecca Carmichael, who is very supportive of this effort and does the media for the law school, uh, reminded me how old I was when she brought up the fact that we're at 50 year anniversary of the Kerner Commission report about race and civil unrest in the country. And one of the things the Kerner Commission did was spoke specifically to the media about a lack of representation of folks of color in newsrooms and media. When I look around at newsrooms today, particularly conventional newsrooms, I see a lack of folks of color writing about the issues at all, much less issues of justice and issues of civil rights and immigration and, and race. And so what accounts for the lack of representation of folks of color in newsrooms? That's a very big question. <laughs> So, some of it undoubtedly is tied to just the economics of the profession. I mean, if, if we're losing journalists, if newsrooms are closing down, if, you know, if venture capitalist firms are coming in, buying up newspapers, and then sort of extracting profit out of them, um, they're not going to be looking to hire any one period. And uh, when you're in a position of managing that kind of situation, your hiring is going to lean more towards what you know, um, lean towards what your networks are, um, and it's just inertia produces networks and, and newsrooms that don't really represent um, the public at large, much less the particular communities they're covering. Um, I think also, you know, part of what, I mean, this is related to that, but part of what one casualty of the collapse of traditional journalism is the collapse of sort of the black press, right? The collapse of, of different elements of the press that did serve those communities, even if they were separate from the mainstream press, and they can't really support themselves anymore. And so mm -hmm. um, I think that's, an, that's somewhat of an underplayed story, because even, even 50 years ago, right, like a lot of the work being done, a lot of the stories being broken were by the black press, were mm -hmm. by um, small re smaller regional newspapers, city, city newspapers, uh, magazines that catered to a, a, a large niche audience, but niche audience nonetheless, and they simply can't sustain themselves anymore. You know, when I look at papers like the Chicago Defender and the Amsterdam News, is it the new media and social media a new avenue to get some of those stories out? I think, I don't know. I, I think there's, it's undoubtedly the case that social media is amplifying stories, is amplifying people's experiences. But let me, let me actually move backwards a little bit. Social media is amplifying people's experiences, but that is a different thing than amplifying stories, right? Like stories require editorial judgment, they require editing, they require resources, and social media cannot take the place of that. Um, it can provide, I think it can provide a, a direction for journalists who, who are trying to cover those communities, but I don't think it can really take the place of, of, an, of institutional work. Um, and the challenge, I think, for journalism in the very near future is to continue to figure out ways to sustain institutional work um, that don't rely on, you know, Google and Facebook. So let me ask you, all of you, I'm sensitive to the fact that we have a lot of students, activists, law students, journalism students in the room. Um, how can advocates or communities ensure that their voices get represented in the stories that you guys tell? What are the hooks? How do they get to you? They can tell their own stories now. I mean, one interesting thing that's been happening in New York City, and maybe it's happening in a lot of places and I just don't know it, is that there's all these, this takes us back to where Jake was saying that there's a million stories happening in courthouses every day that we don't know about. In New York City, there are, and I follow dozens of public defenders on Twitter. Every day, they're basically reporters in the courthouse. They're mm -hmm. reporting what they're seeing and um, stories that are never going to be told elsewhere. And it's obviously not the same as journalism and they're not you know, truly reporters in the sense that they have, you know, that they're coming at the story from one side, but the information that they're supplying is very valuable, 
useful and not going to be shared, shared elsewhere. And they, in a lot of cases, I kind of think of them as a kind of Greek chorus of sort of truth tellers because you, you get the press release from the DA's office about what their new policy is or what they're doing. And then you go to on Twitter and you see all these people with firsthand stories about actually that's not the way it's playing out on the ground. This is happening or that is happening. And they're really holding, at least in New York City, prosecutors accountable. This is mostly Manhattan and Brooklyn. But you know, it is, it is one avenue um, in which social media can play a sort of important role. I, so along with the benefits of being a national outlet that covers local stories, there are some downsides. And one of them is that we're often reporting on places that we're not from. We're not from that community. We don't have the relationships with the defendants. Um, we don't have the relationships with the grassroots groups on the ground. And there are a lot of dynamics and, um, and variables in the way that these situations are playing out that you don't just get from one um, case transcript or one situation or one narrative. You know, these are offices that are seeing some office, I mean, Kim Fox, sees, her office sees 400,000 cases a year. You know, you, if you're not kind of immersed in that, you don't have the context you need to tell a good story. So I think it, for us, it's really important to have, to build those relationships with groups on the ground and talk to them about what they're seeing and ask them for their context of what we're hearing. Um, because uh, otherwise it feels a little, to me it always feels a little predatory to go into a local community where um, these dynamics are literally playing out thousands of times a day, extract one and not try to get context from the people that, um, that are living it. Yeah, and just to add on that, we're currently in, in sort of a privileged spot where we have some capacity to work with freelancers and, and have voices who are on the ground, directly impacted individuals and other folks who either would, who would help be contributing writers so that we can get some of these voices that are, are local, since, we're, since we are we're remote uh, and virtual around the country, but we're not of some of these communities. Um, the other thing, just in terms of some of the ways that we try to capture some of those voices, and I think like these threads, these Twitter threads from, you know, the courthouses in the five boroughs or around the country are a lot of that we try to grab and we put out a newsletter. And part of the point of our daily newsletter that we send to journalists and, and professors and, and advocates and organizers is to help circulate those kinds of stories and whether we want to call them traditional journalism or not, uh, you know, we don't have Sean here today, and Sean is, this is, this is sort of his wheelhouse in terms of the impact somebody can have with an enormous social media presence and an ability to grab a individual story and, and identify its salience and push it out and have real impact and then let the journalists and the academicians and the advocates sort of react to that. Jamel, how do we raise these stories? How do we get them from being a story in Iowa or Idaho to giving them some national prominence and national exposure? Um, How do they get to you? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I mean, in my work, I'm not, I'm typically not one who is doing that. I'm usually looking at stuff that is already sort of like approaching escape velocity and kind of looking at it and commenting on it. I think looking at journalists who do do that kind of work. I mean, I think it's, I think, I think for them, it's the combination of having the resources to pursue stories, of having the institutional backing to, um, to highlight them and, and bring them to the fore. Um, I think it's also a matter of, of having a sense of what, you know, what people are attracted to, what, um, what readers what might surprise readers or, or get them to click or, or open or what have you. But I, that's a difficult question because I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. From my perspective, it sometimes seems sort of like, you know, there's elements of like magic to what becomes mm -hmm. very, very popular and very, um, that receives a ton of public attention. I mean, just to, to talk about uh, issues like I'm familiar with, it is, it, it is beyond me, right, why um, John Crawford's killing in Ohio in the summer of 2014 didn't blow up the way Michael Brown's did. Like, I don't know why 
they happened close together, both terrible incidents, but Michael Brown's became a national story, and Crawford's, not really. I mean, it, it, people who cover it are aware of, of his death, but it's not something that the, the average public knows. And so um, there's a lot of journalists do to influence that, but I think some of it's just sort of like the, the ether, right? Like the moment things happen in. Jen, what do you think triggers that interest? I, don't, I mean, that's the question that newsrooms are trying to figure out across the country. Everyone's trying to figure out the secret and, and make their stories pop, so I don't, I don't have any, any more insight um, on that. I want to focus on Jake and Josie, because some folks in the audience asked me to ask you this. Oh. And, and we'll get to, we have a new section in this where we've, we've actually solicited some other questions, but specifically, um, and there's a relation to Jamel and, and um, Jen on this as well, but why did you make the decision to move from lawyer to media? What influenced that? And in terms of my two journalists on the far end, what's influenced you to focus on issues of race and social justice in the way you have? So let me just work my way down. Joseph? So my answer is going to be different than Jake, because my answer is that I am a very bad lawyer. Um, <laughs> I just wasn't a good lawyer. It just wasn't my thing. I just, I, I knew it like fourth day of law school that I had taken out that loan and um, moved all my stuff up to Boston. And so, um, I, you know, I, I, it's interesting because when I was in college, I really wanted to be a journalist and I thought to myself, well, I really want to make an impact and the way to do that is to be a lawyer. And I think that was myopic and also it was a different time. Um, but that it has been very beneficial, not only um, having a law background, but also working with lawyers to really be able to identify um, the inflection points that matter the most um, when we're talking about these injustices. I think when we were talking earlier about local journalists, one of the problems is that it's hard to identify exactly what's wrong with the criminal justice system if you don't have a background as a lawyer. It's not impossible, but you know, if you're working in a small town getting paid basically nothing to cover 10 different subjects, you're not gonna be figuring out you know, exactly how felony murder should be working in your jurisdiction. Um, and one of the benefits that being a lawyer has is that I have some of that background, but yeah, no, I wasn't. It just was not my skill set <laughs> at all. <laughs> Jake's actually a very good lawyer. I don't know what Jake, remember, was. I've got a lot of law students in the audience before you <laughs> answer. Go ahead. I loved law school. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually serious, I think. <laughs> um, um, well, I, I didn't make the transition from lawyer to journalist because I am, again, not a journalist, right? But to the extent that my my career transition or why I'm in this space rather than, than being a litigator, um, I think is informed by a, a couple of pieces. One, as, as a lawyer doing criminal defense and civil rights work, and particularly having done a lot of capital work, we would tell our clients stories, right? And that's what, that's what we were taught in clinics, and that's what we did in terms of developing mitigation and social history. And, there was always this view, and it was Thurgood Marshall's view in part, that the more you can sort of peel back and show the workings of the capital punishment system, people would just be disgusted and it would not work, but there's, not, we don't have enough of a, of a line on seeing it clearly enough. Um, but then the stories of clients that we would develop these remarkably compelling um, histories, uh, and then they would sit in a judge's, uh, you know, in the, in the courthouse and not get the airing out. And there was always this feeling, and there still is this feeling in the capital community, that if you could just air those things out, we could, we could solve a lot of problems because we can see how people get broken um, and how the system um, can impact a real uh, hurt in lots of different ways. So I've always wanted to do that in a bigger way than in my individual cases. Um, and then just the last piece about me was that in, when I was in North Carolina litigating, we did uh, marriage equality litigation there. And working with local groups, so we were the litigators in court, but working with the national groups and just so smart and intelligent communications and messaging um, people, uh, I was just struck by, wow, that's, if we could have this for every case, this would be amazing. So this idea that we could have a model 
that could, we wouldn't be litigating, um, we, wouldn't, we would be adjacent to that. We would see what's going on in court. We would see people litigating around bail and calling it unconstitutional in various places and that there would be a space for us to tell stories, to amplify that in different ways, felt like it could be a really powerful uh, way of having impact. So Jamel, why issues of race and politics when you could be writing about anything? And Jen, why criminal justice when no one was writing about criminal justice and you were? Well, I'm not sure I could be writing about anything. My, my skill set really, really is, you know, around, uh, so, yeah, around, uh, around politics and, and history and such. That's sort of, that's like the only, literally the only thing I know. So if I weren't a writer, I'm not really sure what I'd be doing. Um, to support myself. Uh, I'll say I've always had like a strong like academic interest in history and sort of like the philosophy of race and like sort of all, all the theoretical stuff. Um, and uh, I think it's always sort of like been part of my writing as a political journalist, but the extent to which I've become really interested in racial inequality specifically is just a, a function of experience as a reporter. I, uh, after Michael Brown was killed, I went to Ferguson and I was there for two weeks and I kind of spent a lot of time exploring, researching, talking in St. Louis and having, and sort of being stunned, maybe that this was naive of me, being stunned by kind of the extent of the kind of racialized inequality that exists in the country. And that really in inspired me to do more of that kind of work and more of that kind of researching and more of that kind of reporting. And I'm not... The, the strongest sort of traditional reporter, but I'm very good at an archive, and I'm very good as a researcher, and I know how to talk to academics. Um, and that's so that's difficult. <laughs> that's sort of the skill set I thought I could bring to bear on these questions. Jen? Um, you know, I just became convinced um, in the late 90s that criminal justice was the most pressing issue in America. And I, sometimes I thought I was the only person who thought that, but. I mean, obviously I wasn't, but I, you know, it just, I just became convinced of it. And a little bit like Jamel talking about his own firsthand experience reporting, I mean, once you go to visit a prison, visit someone in prison, once you go make that trip to Rikers Island, you never forget it. It never leaves you. And it just sort of reinforced that idea. And, you know, I, of course, think everyone in the criminal justice system, judges and DAs ought to take a, make, you know, annual trips to, to or more often to jails and prisons to see what, is going on, but I think, you know, I was talking earlier about the, the media kind of ignoring the criminal justice system for many years, and I feel like I gave the media a pass there. And, and while that is certainly true, the flip side of it, and we haven't really even broached this yet, is the role that the media played in building up the prison industrial complex. I mean, the media was based in, in you know, we say media, and that means a lot of different things, television, print, et cetera, but in a lot of ways, the media has played the role of like a fear-making machine over the decades. I mean, why do we have more than two million people in prison? Because the media would just demonize an entire class of people. Like, I always think about this report that I read in 1998, I even pulled it off the shelf to bring it here. And I'm sure there's better reports that have probably been written since then, but um, <clears throat> it was called Indictment, and it was co-written by Tom Wicker, who was at the, used to be at the Times. And it talked about how, and this was 1998, so we're going back to almost 20 years, and at that point, homicides were down 20% in the prior eight years, but coverage of homicides had gone up 600% in the national media. So why do we have so many law and order DAs? Because the public voted them in. Why did they vote them in? Because the media fed them these stories about fear constantly. And so how did we get to two million people in prison? So it was like thinking about all of those things that made me want to sort of cover this beat and not stop. And do all of you agree that the media should be held accountable for its descriptions, perpetuation of stereotypes and descriptions of folks of color and the, result, the resulting disparities in incarceration based on that? Yeah, I would even go further than that, which is that it, it's not just the stereotypes and it's not just the focus on people of color. It's the explicit refusal to um, ask those people any questions, reach out to people's lawyers, you know, you read most local media stories and it, every sentence ends, law enforcement said, law enforcement said, law enforcement said, I mean, literally. Um, and th there has just been a couple of decades, I read a story last week about <laughs> a woman who was at Walmart and saw someone that she thought was following her around and then it turned out he was not following her around 
but the entire point of the story was to say, look out, someone could be following you around. But nothing had happened to this woman. In fact, I mean, this was literally a local news story. She had her baby, and she, in fact, at the end of the story, it says, <laughs> security checked these people out, and they were shopping in Walmart. I mean, you know, this, this whole, this belief that if you leave your door unlocked, your house is going to get broken into, and your family is going to get taken, is really pervasive. Um, and has um, been encouraged, I think, by local media because it's, because people are into those those stories. But it's it's even beyond news. It's law and order. It's you know it's just this kind of lionizing of law enforcement that has existed for decades. Even though we've known for a very long time just how dangerous and racist law enforcement has been. This is not new news. Even though we're seeing it on on video screens, we you know. We've known this. I mean, one of the one of the striking survey results every year is yeah. Americans. Um, large numbers of Americans say they they're afraid of rising crime, and crime rates have been dropping, dropping. precipitously <laughs> right. for for two decades now. So there's the dis. I think the disconnect is precisely media coverage. It's local media coverage. So I I live in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, um, and so our local news station covers the county, Albemarle County as well, and Nelson County, and a couple other counties. And it's I, I do watch those reports sometimes, and they're, they're very much kind of like, you know, five minutes devoted to um, a kidnapping, five minutes devoting to a carjacking that may have happened, even though that might have been the only carjacking for five years. The the attention to it um, uh, creates the perception, in for a lot of people, that this is like an ever present danger, and thus we need to um, we need to support kind of like hardline. Law and order politicians. You're kind of you're kind of seeing this happen with regards to immigration policy, right? With the constant demonizing of MS-13, mm -hmm. as if every community in the country is just like crawling with murderous gang members. Right. And um, to use my home, uh, my where I live as, as an example, you know, at a, at a, re a recent board meeting of the of the local jail, uh, someone one of the public comment and was like. We gotta, we can't, we gotta cooperate with ICE to keep MS-13 out of Charlottesville, and it's like, wait, excuse me? <laughs> MS-13 does not exist here. It is not a problem, but they're just kind of communicating fear-mongering um, that is amplified by media coverage. So what's the rebuttal to that, Jake? How do we hold media accountable, or how do we put out other a, a different version of stories about what's going on in communities? Uh, more, more good media. Um, you know, I think that's again, that's that's the that's the direction and the model that we're trying to to push um, is that for all the things that we've talked about and all the reasons that at the local level um, you don't have the kind of consistent, inquisitive coverage of these local justice issues. If there can be, there needs to be many steady drumbeats of constantly putting this out. There can't, in my mind, there can't be too many of those stories about um, how notwithstanding statements suggesting a good, a better orientation on public policy by elected district attorneys in boroughs near and far, things are not changing. Um, and so there, ha there, there cannot be enough coverage about following up on whether fair beaters are still being prosecuted and taken to Rikers. There cannot be enough stories about how slow things are moving in the Bronx. Um, and hopefully, you know, as those stories get told more and more often, um, places like the New York Times and other places think that they're relevant and interesting as a criminal justice matter, uh, rather than, I'm not, and I'm not saying that what Jeff Sessions says is unimportant, because it's deeply important and it's deeply disturbing. Um, but to the extent that there, there's an impact happening right now in your neighborhood, uh, that's why the constant focus um, is sort of our MO. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to introduce a new part of this exercise for the center. We have solicited from our audience questions that they'd like you all to take a pass at. And I have those questions. Um, so I'm gonna start. Uh, the first one is, how does the current political climate affect the ways in which we talk about race and inequality now? Compared with when we were in the days of Obama administration, it feels now like we're going backwards and trying to talk about race. 
Sure. Um, so I actually think the opposite's happening. Um, I think during the Obama era, at least in terms of like mainstream reporting and mainstream political writing, it was actually kind of difficult to get people to take seriously the idea that there's entrenched racial inequality because the response is, well, what about Barack Obama? Um, he did pretty well. Uh, what's the issue? And uh, I mean, you saw this, uh, a microcosm of this was when the, after Shelby County in 2013, and there was a sudden rush of voter ID laws and voter suppression laws, um, you saw advocates for voting rights say, listen, these things are gonna have a really big effect on communities of color. And the response, not, not infrequently, was, look how much black people came out to vote for Obama in 2008 and 2012. Um, why do you think that voter ID would keep that from happening? Like, black people are turning out to vote, so there's no reason that getting, a vote, getting ID would make it more difficult. The silver lining of the Trump era, I don't, I, I, hate, I hate that language. One <laughs> unexpected result of the Trump era <laughs> is that the president is so just aggressively racist and is pursuing such aggressively racist public policy that people are suddenly open to arguments about entrenched racial inequality, right? It's easier, it's easier to say, hey, this stuff is a big problem when the guy in the Oval Office, you know, just casually says things um, like, uh, you know, I called him loco because it's Mexico, right? Like if, when the president kind of just can casually say racist things, then I think it's, it's easier to reach people to make arguments that racism and, and racial inequality are, are serious problems. Um, and I think, I mean, my, my experience as far as I think there's been a real appetite for that kind of um, writing and analysis in a way that there wasn't quite during the Obama years. Anybody else want to take a pass at that? I haven't seen the equivalent appetite in the criminal justice world. I think it's still hard. I think racial disparities, mass incarceration are still a story. But I think to grapple with it at a very grassroots level around race is still difficult. Are you guys finding that in the work that you do, Jake and Josie? I'm, um, so I think it depends. We kind of have, there, there seem to be two modes in the stories we cover. One is you're seeing such a stark disparity that it's kind of undeniable what's actually happening. Thinking about some stories we've covered in New Orleans or basically everywhere else in Louisiana. <laughs> um, but you, you are watching you know, only black juveniles get, get sent to adult prison or only black juveniles get sentenced to life without parole. Or you, know, you just can't deny what you're seeing in front of your face. I think the other side of that is um, when it's a little blurrier and it's very difficult to have conversations with people who think that they are looking out for the justice of an entire community and convince them that they're actually perpetuating injustice in that community. It's very hard. Um, and I, um, I, I think it's also hard to tell the people around them that, that, that that's happening. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether in this field, it's gotten much easier or much harder. You know, I think like thinking back to the new Jim Crow and how that was such an important narrative moment that shifted a lot of people's thinking about 10 years ago. Um, we have not, we have not seen another one of those moments. Um, we're seeing it more around bail, but even that is basic is mostly about class. Um, but we are always kind of trying to prove the point. Because we hear a lot from DAs like, we're not racist, it's just that black people uh, commit more crimes because th they had it harder. You know, it's this kind of pity racism instead of, and, and it is hard to um, sift through that sometimes to actually get essentialized down to the, the point, which is that you actually are racist. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I just sort of picking up on both of those threads, the, the, the naked racism of Trump and the fact that it, in some respects, it, and I think I remember the first, the first conversation that you had here, um, and I think it was Sherilyn Eiffel who was saying, well, I'm good, like th this, this sort of takes away some veneer and it may be a little bit easier to sort of see where people may stand. Um, the way that, one example of the way we sort of saw that collide at the local level was when um, 
the administration issued its, its first executive order on immigration, and we put out a report, uh, because what happened, right, after that, among other things, uh, you had local mayors and elected officials in New York's and Boston's and, and other sort of so-called progressive places sort of standing up and beating their chests and saying, not, you know, not here, uh, we oppose you, Mr. Trump. And what we did with some immigration rights groups was to put out a report to say, actually, you're part of the problem because by supporting broken windows, by not asking your police chiefs to do better, by standing silently while your district attorney is, is just marshalling people into the jail, you're feeding this system that you are calling racist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we're, sort we're of the same thing with the child separation thing too. All these mayors and you know these local criminal justice actors being horrified by separating children from their parents, which is literally what they do day in and day out, um, almost without pause. It's different because you're obviously not caging the children, but you know bringing it home for people to say that this is actually what happens when you arrest people for small infractions. You are this what results is separation of families. You know. Um, right here. Yes, we they don't like us that much, but that's okay. So let me give you another audience question. What role, if any, should the media play in advocating for justice? How should the media respond given the current administration's threat to the free press, particularly if the free press has helped bring about justice? What should citizens be doing to ensure that alternative facts are not spread in the age of the viral media? I guess tell, tell as many true facts as you can to try to drown them out. I don't know. That's a very that's a very challenging question. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as supporting the media goes, I mean, I'd say both hold media outlets accountable. Uh, uh, journalists are not perfect. Journalists make mistakes. It's important to understand that those mistakes are nine times out of ten in total good faith, but still to hold them accountable. Um, and also, this is extremely self-serving, but like pay for media that you like. Mm. I mean, really, pay for, if you if you like a, a news outlet, pay for it. Buy a subscription. Make a donation. Um, that stuff really does matter. And as journalistic outlets struggle to find new business models, I think one of the ones they're going to have to land on is just people actually exchanging money for content, um, which is, in, the, in, in terms of journalism, is still kind of a very novel thing. It's, it's different when you're a nonprofit in the journalism world than a for-profit, advertised-driven industry. Mm -hmm. um, how has that affected you all's business? Well, I don't run the numbers, so Jake <laughs> might have um, more insight. But it, I think it's been mostly a blessing um, because we can tell stories that we're, we don't have to worry about clicks as much as we, we might otherwise, and it, it requires us to tell complicated stories. You know, I think to the point about um, alternative facts, part of what's hard is not getting too dogmatic to the point that you lose the fact that this stuff is complicated, that every defendant that you talk about that has a very clean, nice story. Um, there are a lot of defendants that don't have clean, nice stories and are guilty and not everything is a wrongful conviction and um, being able to still point out injustices when they happen to people that you might not like. Um, and I, I have not, in my experience, my fairly limited experience writing professionally, have not had a space where you can do that well. Um, and I think our model gives more room for that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, and it does for now um, because it, I mean because it's working. And so, as a nonprofit, funder-supported newsroom. Yeah, so you guys can donate to us too. If you, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You, you buy subscriptions to us, <laughs> and you donate to them. Um, yeah, I mean, we. I, I think we recognize. I think the, the team at the Appeal and all of us recognize that we're in in a lucky space right now. Uh, to be able to, uh, we want things to get clicks. We want people to read because that's important because that has impact. So it has to be salient. It has to be sticky. We want it to go places. Um, 
But if the only person who reads one story is the PR chief for a local district attorney and says, that's a bad look for you, we should give that money back from that bail bondsman, mm -hmm. um, that's sort of a win uh, mm -hmm. for the project writ large. Um, and so our measures of success, our metric, they're just, they're different and we we're thankful that mm -hmm. they are different um, because we consider this as, again, part of one of the many tools that we're trying to, to use to um, affect the change. So all of you have said at one point tonight, Jamel most recently, we need to keep the media accountable. When we're not buying subscriptions, we're keeping that media accountable. How do you guys find that accountability with a nonprofit? Um, yeah, it's hard when you, like, we have a lot less funders, right, than obviously everybody taking out small, you know, a subscription, having thousands of people take out a subscription, and that means you are um, dealing with maybe less input, but also one lost funder has a big impact. Um, I think that we have been held accountable I'm thinking, I'm just thinking about all the angry emails I've gotten from DAs. <laughs> That's how I'm held accountable. I think, look, there have, been, there have been a number of times when I've written something that someone has responded who's actually in the story and said, like, here are actually my competing concerns. And some of them I hadn't thought about, right? Like, if I, if I hadn't been able to talk to that person um, or, you know, had not been able to have that sort of conversation, it is important to be getting a different perspective from someone who's actually working in the system day after day, because that, that's not my job. I, I wouldn't want to be a prosecutor. That sounds stressful. So um, I, think, I think that a lot of times the nature of our work, like we were saying earlier, because it's so responsive, because the return on the investment is so high when these people are covered so rarely, is that we're often held accountable by the people that we're, that we're you know, trying to talk about and that accountability may or may not be relevant or resonant, but it, it exists in a way that it, again, wouldn't if I, we were writing about Trump. So let me ask a question near and dear to my heart from a student. Given limited time, how should one keep up with the news in order to stay active in the fight for social justice and stay an informed citizen? In other words, do I really have to get a Twitter account? No. No, Twitter is bad. Yeah. I'm like, don't keep up with the news. That's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> So Except how, read the appeal. How should they keep up? How should they keep up? I would say find a few sources of news that you trust and just stick with them. I mean, you can get, and I, all of us, I'm sure, you know, it just feel, it's just overwhelming to, to um, just sort of be swimming in the sea of media, especially when there's so much bad news going on. And so you have to sort of keep your head screwed on straight and, and sane in these kind of rough times. So I don't know. I think... You're, I find it funny that you guys are telling people not to get on Twitter when you guys are on Twitter all We're the time, but deep. I would say yeah. just follow these two or three on Twitter and you'll be all set. <laughs> I was actually going to say you could read Jamel's Twitter feed. It's pretty, it'll tell you stuff. But also don't be in law school and follow the news. That feels like a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Also, in, addi in addition to finding outlets that you like or even going on Twitter and following news outlets, I strongly, I, I strongly believe that there's a lot of value in just like reading books and, and keeping up with published history and scholarship if that interests you and kind of broadening um, your sense of the world beyond like the, what is immediate, which is what news tends to do. Um, I, I find myself, even if what I'm reading isn't directly related to um, what's going on in the world. Last year, I spent like four months reading a bunch of histories of the French Revolution. I don't know why, I just I wanted to do it. Um, it. It still is valuable in terms of um, kind of keeping yourself grounded and keeping your perspective, I think, broader. I was just gonna say, what, do what Jamel does and not what I do, which is consume all media, <laughs> good, bad, and, and indifferent. Um, and I'm not going to put, put, put a plug in for Twitter, but as somebody who never was on it, um, in, the, in the narrow space of criminal justice reform, it, it's an, an immensely useful um, space to be in, uh, in part because 
you're getting real-time feeds from what's happening when ICE walks into the Brooklyn courthouse mm -hmm. and public defenders are walking out and you're seeing it in real time. You could wait until later and read about it um, if it gets covered. But to me, as a consumer of those kinds of things, I have to admit I find it to be really useful. Let me ask a follow-up. To what extent are we seeing, I, I alluded to it in my earlier comments, but I've seen, and I've probably got more years than all of you put together, but I've, I've seen an adjustment in the news cycle. To what extent now is social media and Twitter driving news so that we do eventually see it or it gets to Jamel's attention so we see it on a national front or Jen writes about it over a period of, of weeks rather than days? Um, how much is social media now beginning to, to the tail wag the dog, if you would? I think it's maybe less with us because our stories tend to be um, so much smaller and so much not really getting attention before um, before we're shining a light. So I'm not sure. I think it's probably more difficult in a job like Jamel's. I mean, there's always the problem of mistaking what's happening on Twitter with with what is happening in the world. And yeah. I think, I mean, I think for. And I'm sure I know for a fact that Slate has unfortunately done some of this of as using Twitter as like a source to generate content, um, and that is easy to do. I try to avoid it um, as much as possible. Uh, Twitter for me surfaces interesting information, interesting facts, things I might have missed in my own work, but I try I really try to not use it. Um, as a jumping out point, if someone if someone's like, do you want to comment on a tweet? My reaction, unless it is like something especially egregious from the actual press in the United States, um, is to say no, not at all. Jen, what about you? Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Remind me what I'm supposed to. <laughs> How much are you using social media? As oh, a to drive. Sword? You know, I think. I, I uh, you know, I follow things to see what's going on but, and sort of gauge what, you know, as Jake was saying, get the firsthand, you know, take on the ground from, from lawyers and courthouses and whatnot. But I think, um, I think if you're really doing your job, you're doing sort of like, as Jamel says, you're thinking on your own, what's important, what should I be covering? And you're not just being reactive to whatever is hot at the moment. I mean, that is the sort of you know, immediate instinct one might have in a newsroom if they're completely pressed for time and they're supposed to turn something out this minute. But I think, you know, I feel fortunate to have the luxury to be able to think a little bit more broadly and have a little bit more time and just to think, you know, what do I think is the most important thing that ought to be covered and try to go down that path and not just sort of follow the herd of, of everybody else. Can I just say one thing that social media, I think, has been really beneficial for, and um, I think Twitter especially, is language, word choice, narrative. So a lot of what we face is the word, the literal words that local journalists, I mean, mainly, and I, I, I say that because that's where a lot of our stories are originally sourcing from, use, you know, words like felon, criminal, convict, um, you know, that seem sort of um, just normal, but actually have a lot of weight. And the, uh, the officer involved shooting is another one of my favorite you know, these, these phrases that kind of obscure the, the fact that we're talking about real people doing real things. Um, and I think that it has been a useful tool to kind of try to get people to shift the way, the frames in which they're thinking um, of these stories in the moment. Obviously, shifting it within a journalist isn't necessarily shifting them the readers, but hopefully if the journalist changes the way that they talk about it, then... Um, readers aren't getting as much of that, so. Let me flip that the other way. Um, one of the things that we teach within our clinics, um, and Jake was exposed to that a little bit, is some form of media advocacy, recognizing if you want to affect the outcome for an individual client or for an issue or for a community, you have to interact with the media. Um, what recommendations do you have for the law students that are sitting in the room that need to learn how to interact with the media as kind of a way to think about doing that as part of their overall advocacy strategy. Um, send me tips. Send you no, tips. Sorry. No, I, I think that um, I think that it is very important for people to understand who they're talking about when they're telling a story about someone accused of a crime. Like to really understand who that person is. Even if it's just what neighborhood did they grow up in or what elementary school did they 
um, attend. One thing I noticed, I'm, I've been working on this project uh, that has me going through a lot of old Atlanta Journal Constitution articles, and you can tell when they're talking about crime in certain neighborhoods, the, the more minority, um, lower income neighborhoods, because they talk about the offender with, you know, thug and convict, and they also don't really talk about the victim with any care either. It's very clinical in a way that um, I think can just become rote and pattern. Um, and so, I mean, Jake was saying this earlier about his clients who obviously are on death row. Um, making sure that people understand that they are people, that they start, you know, they're there like, just like the rest of us and the, these decisions, you know, not everybody who's, who's committed a murder reads like Ted Bundy, right? You know, these are complicated people. I'm sure Ted Bundy was complicated too, but less complicated than some of Jake's clients, I, I promise. <laughs> I would say if you're dealing with the media that you should know your journalists before you get on the telephone. Like you should figure out who you're talking to, read their work, understand where they're coming from as much as you can. Really, you know, because every, you know, the media, the media is a million different people with a million different points of view and experiences and levels of knowledge and you want to be able to have a conversation that's going to obviously, you know, achieve whatever your, your goal is and I think the best way is to do your homework first. And, and also, before you open your mouth and start talking, think, do I want to see this in the paper? Do I want to see this? Like, don't just, you know, as everybody does, just go off and live to regret it the next day. So before we close, I've got a room full of activists, students, aspiring journalists. I've got a panel of rock stars. What advice would you give to these folks in the room who care about social and racial justice, who care about the racial disparities in the criminal justice system, who want to reduce mass incarceration. Um, what advice do you have for these folks in the room? Jake, let me start with you. Thank you. Um, number one, that there's, there's space for you uh, to put your shoulder to the oar and, and help. Um, I mean, there's, there's no, and I think I have found, have, remembering what I was thinking as a law student graduating in 2002 and knowing that there was sort of, in my mind, one path and one path only that was into criminal defense and there's one way to sort of do this. Um, I am humbled by the many, many, many different ways I have now seen um, you can do this kind of work. Um, with a law degree, Exhibit A, right here next to me. Um, and, um, and then just because this is more biographical than anything else, sort of never being afraid to reinvent yourself in, in this movement um, and in this space. Exhibit A, you wanna comment? Yeah. <laughs> I think that, and this may be unique to, to me or to the law experience, uh, the law student experience in general, but I, felt when I was in law school that I was not good at law school because I kept saying that the law should be different. Like, I, you know, I kept just, I, that was my whole thing. It's like, it just shouldn't be this way. And I have now found a job that allows me to tell people what the law should be. Um, so um, I lucked out. But I do think that figuring out where, which side you want to be on. Do you want to be on the side of um, working within the structures that already exist to fix um, what needs to be fixed, which I think is amazing and I admire, or, but there is a lot of room to shape a new reality for people if you can, um, if you can paint a picture for these systems that, that are, can change. I mean, they're not there yet, but it's possible. Um, this is not, this is not, um, set in stone. Jen? Um, I would say never give up. And especially for anyone who's thinking about doing anything in the media world. I mean, it's such a 
dark time in terms of like the you know possibilities for finding a job, for making a living, and being a journalist. And there's so much rejection baked into the process of being a reporter anyway, whether it's somebody not calling you back, whether you're a freelance writer and the editor never replies to your email, or you're sending a pitch in and people don't respond. I mean, any journalist will tell you there's been a lot of rejection along the path. And the, the journalists, I think, who end up the most successful might not be the best writers or the best reporters, but they're the people that never, ever gave up. And I would say persistence. If you think you're going to do something in the media world is sort of the single most important quality. Mr. Bowie, let me give you the last word here. Yeah, my last word is going to be a, the second that. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, uh, journalism is sort of uh, a whole lot of failure for the sake of the occasional breakthrough. And if you're trying to get into the industry to begin with, um, uh, Pushing forward and, and not giving in to that failure, I think it's absolutely vital. Um, and I would say for if you're if you're pursuing a law degree and you want to get into journalism, uh, that I myself know plenty of plenty of journalists who have law degrees and that that they've been able to bring that knowledge and those skills to bear, not just on things relating to law, but sort of to a broad spectrum of issues and concerns. So, uh, just I, I say this to anyone who asks me about what they're studying and whether they should go into journalism, that journalism is a trade and a practice that you can learn regardless of what your actual training is in. So let me say that as dark as times seem, all of you in your individual and in some ways collective capacity has given, have given us a sense of hope and we thank you for that. Join me in thanking my panel.